what is the relationship between how we think about politics on one hand and how we think about metaphysics, first philosophy, ontology, theology, and all of that on the other hand? In other words, is there a way in which your basic metaphysical principles give rise to different kinds of political ideas? And on the other hand, ways in which if you scratch the surface of a political idea, you can find its underlying metaphysical presupposition. That's an idea that I've been interested in since my undergraduate days, so for a long time now. And I have a paper that I want to present to you today which explores that topic in a specific context. So let me just give you the background very quickly because I think it'll be helpful. I was a master's student at the University of Toronto, and the course was called Politics of Origins. Not a bad course, actually. We read Genesis, we read Lucretius, and we read Rousseau. And the idea was that each of these sources, the Bible, Lucretius, and Rousseau, have a different account about the nature of human origins, the nature of human life. And each in their own way, they culminated in a different kind of social and political doctrine or teaching. Now, one of the things we didn't really do in that class was a kind of systematic breakdown of the conceptual distinctions and conceptual relations between on one hand, politics, on the other hand, metaphysics, but that's something that I was interested in doing. And so I proposed to write a paper that kind of does that, which is what I'm gonna to present to you here. But one other thing I have to add to the picture, in part because it was the book of Genesis from the Hebrew Bible that we read to start the course off with, which by the way, highly recommended reading. You don't have to read it as a believer necessarily, but if you read it in a philosophical spirit or in the spirit of trying to understand thoughtfully what's implied by that teaching, it's well worth your while, hopefully needless to say. But in any case, maybe because we were studying the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, and maybe because I was so involved in some readings of Leo Strauss's, the greatest political philosopher, uh, the greatest scholar of political philosophy of all time, Leo Strauss, I was reading some things of his on the Jewish problem and on the relationship between the divinely revealed law and a certain kind of political teaching. So all of this was on my mind, okay, both in the course and outside of the course. And so I took the occasion of this paper to take the theme of the politics of origins, warring metaphysics, and to apply it as best as I could to the Jewish notions in Strauss's thought that I was reading at the time, okay? So you're gonna see some of that come out in this paper. And uh, keep in mind, just like I said in the last video, this was written 10 years ago. It was written by a master's student. So there are things that I may phrase differently. There are things that I might think differently. But the reason I'm going into the archives, into the vault to present these old papers to you is because I think it could be helpful to stimulate thoughtfulness among some of you who are watching and give you directions to work through, whether in support or in opposition to the ideas that I put out here. So that's a little prefatory remark, okay? Here's the basic idea. Political teachings depend implicitly or explicitly on accounts of ultimate or proximate origins. The latter are reducible to the former and the conflict among the former is undecidable. In other words, you take a political position, you derive its metaphysical basis, but there's a war among metaphysical positions, and that war is apparently undecidable. There is thus a war of metaphysics, a war of politically relevant opinions about the whole. By the way, you may know I do work on Alexander Dugan. He has a book on this topic, actually a series of books, 20 plus volumes called Nootomachia. And to the best of my recollection, I was not yet aware of Dugan's Nootomachia project when I wrote this. Otherwise, I would have referred to it, I would imagine. So... The thought of a war of metaphysics, irresolvable conflict of first principles, was on my mind even before encountering that idea in Dugan's thought. The liberal project aims to diffuse this war, an impossible project at any rate, and too much paid for to boot from the perspective of seriousness. In other words, one way to dissolve a war, as you saw in the last video if you watched it, is to compromise on first principles. But the question is, is it worth the compromise if those principles are so dear and important to you if they're constitutive of who you are. The paper starts, I took probably excessive liberties here. It starts with three quotations, maybe four quotations from uh, Leo Strauss, all from one collection of essays of his called Liberalism Ancient and Modern. And you'll see that the Jewish aspect of this question was on my mind. So he writes, 
From every point of view, it looks as if the Jewish people were the chosen people, at least in the sense that the Jewish problem is the most manifest symbol of the human problem, insofar as it is a social or political problem. I happen to think that's maybe one of the profoundest characterizations of the quote-unquote Jewish problem or Jewish question that you're going to find anywhere, but you have to chew on it a little bit. Next quote is this one. Prior to Hitler's rise to power, most German Jews believed that their problem had been solved in principle by liberalism. The German Jews were Germans of the Jewish faith, that is, they were no less German than the Germans of the Christian faith or of no faith. They assumed that the German state, to say nothing of German society or culture, was or ought to be neutral to the difference between Christians and Jews or between non-Jews and Jews. This assumption was not accepted by the strongest part of Germany and hence by Germany. Then the serious question concerns man's certainty or knowledge of the divine promises or covenants. And finally, the genuine refutation of orthodoxy would require the proof that the world and human life are perfectly intelligible without the assumption of a mysterious God. It would require at least the success of the philosophic system. Man has to show himself theoretically and practically as the master of the world and the master of his life. The merely given world must be replaced by the world created by man theoretically and practically. These are deep thoughts, needless to say, that the refutation of orthodoxy means the success of the philosophic system, the proof that man can replace the given world by the made or created world, the artificial world, artificially constructed island of intelligibility, to use a phrase that Strauss writes in characterizing Hobbes' thought in Natural Right and History. But if you just put these four quotes together, why did I start with them? You have the Jewish problem. The Jewish problem is a problem concerning the relationship somehow between politics and theology, the serious question concerning man's certainty or knowledge of the divine promises and covenants, and the notion that orthodoxy, which is a certain attitude towards those promises or covenants, has not been genuinely refuted, and therefore that liberalism is not necessarily superior to its alternatives. That's all implied in that particular selection of quotations to open the essay. But now we turn to the exposition proper. How does the way we conceive of origins issue in a teaching about political things? In this essay, I aim to show that a number of historically relevant political teachings or positions depend more or less explicitly on quote-unquote metaphysics or an account of the whole, including particularly an account of the origins of the whole. First, I develop a schema that captures five historically relevant alternative accounts of the whole, each of which has social or political implications. Then I argue that accounts of proximate origins, for instance, the origin of language or of society, rests on accounts of ultimate origins of metaphysics. So in other words, you might ask, like, what's the origin of society? What's the origin of language? But you can't answer that until you go a step deeper, a step further. And with this step, any political teaching that outwardly eschews metaphysics can nevertheless be seen as a self-endorsing some version of thereof, uh, some version thereof implicitly. I should tell you very quickly. There was a uh, once a movement of thought that said metaphysics is inherently totalitarian, fascist, and uh, anti-liberal, and therefore liberalism is going to dispense with metaphysics, sort of free us from the totalitarianism of metaphysics, and the freedom will replace metaphysics as if freedom doesn't have an underlying metaphysics of its own. Okay, you see what I'm saying? So the claim in this paper was. Even apparently anti-metaphysical positions in politics are nevertheless metaphysical if you just dig into it a little bit. You could say same with theology, right? Atheistic positions have their own implicit theological belief system. You sometimes hear that kind of argument today. So then I distinguish these accounts further using a fourfold matrix. You're going to like this. So one of the reasons I want to present this paper is to show you these things. The fourfold matrix of the elements true, untrue, useful, and harmful. You're going to like that when we get to it. And then fourth, I offer an alternative project to Thomas Pangle's reopening of the quarrel between classical political philosophy and biblical revelation. Thomas Pangle was a student of Leo Strauss's, and he has some great and thought-provoking books on that, biblical revelation and classical political philosophy. Fifth, I discuss critically the liberal instance of the metaphysics-politics relationship. And finally, I argue for an agonistic or confrontational politics, which corresponds to the ultimately confrontational because undecidable character of these various metaphysical 
accounts. So let's start with the first step, the typologies. It's possible to schematize a number of alternative accounts of ultimate origins in the following manner. This was, like I said, we read Genesis Lucretius Rousseau, but we didn't really schematize or formulate, formulate or formalize the possible, you know, periodic table of elements when it comes to all the relevant permutations here. So I kind of wanted to do that. First, there either is or there is not a primeval principle of intelligence in the whole. Second, the whole either always was or came to be. Like, is the universe created or eternal? And is it ruled by intelligence or not? If it came to be, it came to be from something coeval with the principle of intelligence, a first matter, from out of that principle itself or from nothing. If it always was, in other words, if the universe is eternal, then the principle of intelligence can be thought of, for instance, as that which moves the celestial bodies through their desire for it, which otherwise simply thinks itself, an Aristotelian account. You're going to see this in a table form in a minute. Conversely, if there's no principle of intelligence and the world came to be, contemporary materialistic neo-Darwinism perhaps, then there's a neck plus ultra for questioning reason, like something that you can't, you know, there's nothing further beyond it. And if there's no principle of intelligence in the world, that is the stuff of the whole has always been, it's possible to posit with the Epicureans the eternity of atoms and void. This is what I learned from Lucretius. And more or less seriously, more or less consistently, swerve in other mechanisms required to account for the world as phenomenally experienced. In other words, I said, here's, here we should, here's how we should slot Lucretius and the Epicureans into the picture. They deny a principle of intelligence, and they say that the stuff of the whole has always been. And so there's an eternity of Adam's void and swerve. The table below summarizes five such historically and politically relevant accounts according to this schema. So there you go. This is in a chart form what I just said. Either the world is generated or ungenerated, and either there is an intelligent principle or there's no intelligent principle. And then you can sort of map out a variety of positions. In Aristotelianism, there is an intelligent principle, but the world is ungenerated. It's eternal. In the Bible, there's an intelligent principle, but the world is generated. In Epicureanism, no intelligent principle, and it's ungenerated. And perhaps in neo-Darwinistic materialism, like first you have the Big Bang, then you have all kinds of random whatever. You have generation, but no intelligent principle, okay? That's a schema of ways of thinking about ultimate origins. Now, not every politically relevant account of origins is an account of ultimate origins. Accounts concerning the origins of language, for instance, although they might be implicitly bound up with an account of the whole, can nevertheless be presented autonomously with political re uh, relevance. So in that same class, I happened to have written a paper on the question of the origin of language. I think it was one that was assigned. So it's probably just, uh, you know, tipping my hat to the fact that we had discussed the question of the origin of language just previously. Here, the major alternatives are language emerged from below. So like language, you know, uh, there's matter, matters, whatever it is, the animals and animals scream and cry. And gradually those screams and cry cries acquire some sort of significance. That's like language emerges from sublinguistic phenomena. But then there's also the idea that language descends from above as the unfolding of higher soul faculties. You know, in the beginning was the word, not in the beginning was the senseless scream of the monkey or whatever. So as the unfolding of higher soul faculties, as the actualizing of a potentiality of intellect, as the point of contact between man and the suprahuman logos. I have argued elsewhere that one's teaching concerning the origins of language is best understood as a function of one's metaphysics or account of the whole. And that's referred to my previous paper there, which I can read to you on another occasion if you'd like. A materialist conception of the whole will view language as emergent from voice. For instance, whereas an account of the whole as intelligent in principle will likely favor the account from above. So if you just go back to this chart, what you think about language will vary depending on which of these cells you fall into. You know, if you're biblical, in the beginning was the word, language is something quite important. Whereas if you're near neo-Darwinistic materialism, language is going to have a different significance. Okay, that's hopefully clear and you can argue with it if you'd like to. I'd like to know what you think. So besides the origins of language, the origins of social and political life have implications for any politics of origins. There again, I was referring to the name of the class, but I thought the concept itself was much richer than the way that we treated it in the class. So that's how I borrowed the concept for this exposition. Here, accounts can differ in whether they accord to social and political life the status of being natural, conventional, accidental, 
a consequence of history and man's passive capacity to adjust the circumstances, or providential. Like, what do you think about social and political life? Is it natural? Is it unnatural, conventional? Is it accidental? Or is it even providential? You see? That's going to depend. If you're a believer, then you're going to see social and political life to some extent as more providential than accidental, more providential than conventional. You see? These accounts are distinguished in part by their understanding of man, whether he has a nature or not. And if he has, whether it's teleological or not, whether it's bound up with the higher order or whether it constructs the relevant rational orders to which it is then subject, whether it is historical or not, and if so, in what sense, and so on. Okay, in other words, all these basic social teachings are fundamentally different at the level of first principles concerning the, the nature of man. Among those accounts that either deny that man has a nature or deny that nature has any enduring relevance or provides any standards of judgment, other politically relevant notions, reason and freedom, for instance, acquire emphatic significance. So like if you reject the notion of human nature, then you take your orientation by some other notion. And uh, historically, it's been like freedom as opposed to nature, or reason as opposed to nature, or will as opposed to nature. Okay, so there are di different ways that that can be uh, set up. Accounts concerning the origins of social and political life, like accounts concerning the origins of language, rest implicitly on some account of man, of the whole and man's relation to it. It is impossible that a Lucretian account of the whole could issue in a teaching concerning society as providential for the simple reason that providence plays no part and can play no part in the Lucretian account of the whole. Okay, if you understand Lucretius's teaching, you understand that you're not going to have providence in it. Likewise, properly understood, the biblical account cannot issue in a social contract state of nature, teaching about the origin of social and political life. Okay, they're incompatible. As Thomas Pangle argues, the early modern attempt to reinterpret or even rewrite the Bible consistent with that teaching constitutes a titanic strategy of propaganda in the service of a vast secular cultural revolution. As Richard Velkley remarks, the early modern teaching targets primarily the ordinary belief that nature is ordered teleologically for human benefit. Though in classically, you think that. You think that nature is ordered teleologically for human benefit. But the early modern account of the origins of political and social life is made possible by a rejection of the biblical account of the origins of the whole. You see here already warring metaphysics, right? The war against the providential account of the whole and so on. It depends on the teaching that no species, forms, wholes of any sort are given parts of a natural order. Okay, there's no such thing as a natural whole, natural form, natural species. Not only does the early modern teaching rest on a teaching concerning the origin of political and social life, which requires a metaphysics, it also issues by design in the politics of liberalism. In short, there appears to be a function between accounts of ultimate origins and accounts of the origins of political and social life on one hand, and a function between such accounts and teachings of the good, the end of social and political life. This nexus between metaphysics or ultimate origins, sociogenesis or proximate origins, and political teachings is the focal point of what follows. So everything to be said, everything that I said so far was to set up the idea that there is such a function between how we think about social and political life and how we think about ultimate origins. Of the varying accounts of ultimate origins, it is possible to think that they are true or untrue and politically useful or politically harmful. For instance, someone might hold that the biblical account is true but harmful, another that it's untrue but useful, a third that it's true and useful, a fourth that it's untrue and harmful. Modern materialists tend to hold the latter view. True believers, on the other hand, maintain that the Bible is both true and useful. Of course, finer degrees of difference can be introduced too, but whatever other relevant distinctions can be drawn, the distinction between true and untrue and useful and harmful captures important differences in outlook regarding these accounts. Let us call all those positions that characterize an account as untrue but useful civil religion positions. The other positions can be named and charted together with the civil religion position as follows. And you should understand that civil religion is a key notion in political theory, political philosophy. It's the idea that governments can use, see, a politically useful, a belief that they themselves think is false, see, untrue, for the management of society. But you know, that really only captures a small part of the picture because you have to expand the table to see the big picture. Okay, and I gave these names. So civil religion, if it's untrue, 
and it's harmful, you call it a harmful error. If it's harmful but true, you call it elite metaphysics. So like the truth is known to the elite, but they keep it from the people because it's harmful. And if it's true and seen as politically useful, then it's a political metaphysics. It's not just for the elite. All accounts of origins can be superimposed onto this table. Epicureanism, for instance, can be seen as a political metaphysics, an elite metaphysics, a civil religion, or a harmful error. Okay, it depends on what you think about uh, Epicureanism. Also, a civil religionist in one aspect may be an elite metaphysician in another respect. For instance, Epicureanism understands itself as an elite metaphysics, which treats the Roman religion as a civil religion. Okay, or like I'm uh, teaching Plato's laws in another context, then in some sense, the Olympic gods are the civil religion, you know, Hades, Zeus, Apollo. But there is also an uh, elite metaphysics and elite teaching about the cosmic gods okay but not everybody gets to learn it and so on if we equate for a moment epicureanism with ancient liberalism which again is an idea that i pick up from strauss's book liberalism ancient and modern then it is perhaps possible schematically to distinguish modern from ancient liberalism by remarking that modern liberalism is characterized by a political metaphysics of materialism that treats religion largely as a harmful error like religion is a lie, religion is false, religion is for stupid people. Whereas Epicureanism is characterized by an elite metaphysics of materialism that treats religion as a civil religion. So like there's a dispute over the usefulness of even false religious belief. The combination of an elite metaphysics with a civil religion can itself perhaps more generally be subsumed under the category of pre-modern enlightenment, the enlightenment of the few. Okay, I do think that's accurate even 10 years later. So as I just said, in Plato's Laws, you have a kind of notion of that. Elite metaphysics plus civil religion. In the remainder of this essay, I shall focus on the problem of political metaphysics in the politics of origin. So if you look at the table, what am I focusing on? The category of teachings that are taken to be true and useful. So we're not talking about the noble lie of religion. We're not talking about atheistic rejection of religion, okay? We're not talking about the true teaching for the very, very few, one that's seen as politically harmful, but rather right here, useful and true. By focusing on the problem of political metaphysics in the politics of origins, does one not set aside temporarily, at least, the insights of the tradition of classical political philosophy, according to which metaphysics is the province of the philosopher alone, who's radically heterogeneous to the polity or political unit, and who, although depending on it to a certain extent, nevertheless poses as much danger to it as knowledge poses to opinion. Let me just explain that. So you have a classical notion here that metaphysics or first philosophy or the high and difficult teachings are always for the few. Always for the few. The few and the rare, okay, as Heidegger puts it in Contributions to Philosophy of the Event. The true philosophy is for the few and the rare. So by focusing on this, political metaphysics, aren't we stepping away from that old view that the most genuine insights of metaphysics are the province of the philosopher alone, and that the philosopher stands in some sort of radical heterogeneity with respect to the political community, like a key idea in Leo Strauss's thought. Does not the classical teaching par excellence belong to the pre-modern enlightenment as a combination of elite metaphysics and civil religion? So again, philosophy for the few, religion for the many, so to speak. But must an analysis of the question begin with a predisposition to favor the classical solution? So here I'm saying, look, all of the authors that we read and all of the approaches that we take, you know, in this class and in the school of thought, they sort of begin in one box of this table, but I want us to begin in another box. We don't have to start in the same place every time. If the classical solution is to view revealed codes of law, the political metaphysics of revelation, as a function of political philosophy, elite metaphysics plus civil religion, does not the classical solution fail to understand the revealed codes of law in their own terms as they understand themselves, which is surely as more than merely civil religions? So in short, like some of the members of this intellectual school of thought said, let's treat revelation as civil religion, therefore as false, but useful. And I say, well, let's take the stand of the position of a true believer in revelation for the purposes of this analysis and look around from there and see what we see. These divine codes rest on an account of the whole and its origins and issue in a political teaching in the form of a code of law. 
They deserve to be taken as seriously as any other variation of the metaphysical, opinion, political teaching coupling. But to be taken seriously is to be taken seriously on one's own terms. Uh, I think I remember that the professor of this class, he took issue with that. He says, no, you can take something seriously, not on its own terms. You know, you can take seriously, you can take a madman seriously without taking him seriously on his own terms. So I don't know, see what you think about that. On their own terms, these teachings are neither elite metaphysics, nor merely civil religions, nor harmful heirs. Rather, they are political metaphysics. Therefore, the category of political metaphysics deserves to be elaborated autonomously. I can see that I made let's say, a mistake there in the sense that the revel the revelation, biblical revelation doesn't call itself political metaphysics. And in that sense, it doesn't think of itself in terms of political metaphysics, but it does think of itself as true and useful. And in that sense, you know, we name it political metaphysics. Okay, but let's go back. Um, where were we here? In previous paragraphs, I've spoken of divine codes of law and referred to the political metaphysics of revelation. The category of political metaphysics does not, as I have defined it, require that the teaching considered as true and politically useful stem from a view of the whole as intelligent and created, nor does it require that that teaching issue in a code of law as it happens to do in some cases. Because the category is characterized merely as true and politically useful, even metaphysical materialism can be taken as political metaphysics, as I indicated above by speaking of the political metaphysics of materialism. Generally, any of the various accounts of the whole can be superimposed on the above matrix more or less consistently with an account's self-understanding and can consequently be thought of as political metaphysics. Because the Jewish problem is the problem lying at the heart of these inquiries, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, in this section I want to elaborate the question especially of the political metaphysics of revelation, of the revealed code of divine positive law, of the Torah, but also by implication of Islamic Sharia. A dialogue between classical political philosophy and the political metaphysics of Revelation is attempted by Thomas Pangle in his book, Political Philosophy and the God of Abraham. For Pangle, in order that we assess fully and appreciate our being shaped by the great project of the modern rationalists in their achievement and in their failing, we need to recover their own radical perspective on the fundamental challenge from Revelation. This theological political investigation, which proceeds directly against the current set in motion, by the project of the theological political treaties that launched modernity and consists in recovering the possibility of a philosophic interrogation of the Bible, as he puts it, is required in order to break out of this cultural amusement park that more or less benevolently, benevolently excuse me, confines us like etiolated adolescents. In other words, we have to get serious and to get serious, we have to reconstruct the conflict that shaped our moment. And that conflict was primarily and fundamentally a break with biblical revelation. And if we really want to assess the legitimacy of that break, we have to stage the conflict again. It is on account of the great success of the modern project, which has rendered unserious discussion, not only of theology, but of humanity's spiritual fulfillment and destiny, that there's practically no access to genuine encounter with the texts that make possible a passionate and intense quest for final answers to the fundamental and abiding questions of the eternal truth about divinity and human excellence. Pangle is saying modernity has been so successful in its war against the pre-modern that the pre-modern concern of human excellence and human flourishing has been pretty much taken off the table. We must, Pangle argues, break out of this bind on the level of serious and meditative thought, but not on the socio-political level. For a reversal of the socio-political achievement of liberation and reconstruction affected by the Enlightenment is as unlikely in the foreseeable future as it would be deleterious. In other words, he's saying we need to reconstruct the conflict, but only on the plane of thought, not on the social plane. We want to keep the social advancements of modern liberalism, but we want to subject the principles of modern liberalism to an encounter with the pre-modern in thought. It's too dangerous politically. Crucially, he continues, the philosophic inquiry into divine law and law giving, into the foundation or vindication of law as such, in its majesty or in its most complete self-expression, is the authentic expression of classical political philosophy. Pangle's assertion that his project is animated by the revival of political philosophy, understood as the essential and dialectical partner antagonist of political theology. Uh, yeah, that's what Pangle asserts, okay? So political philosophy as an antagonist of political theology. Thus, Pangle's book is an attempt to consider from the point of view of the pre-modern enlightenment, classical political philosophy, 
The undistorted challenge posed to that enlightenment's elite metaphysics by the political metaphysics of revelation, but with a predisposition in favor of the former approach. Let me just restate that in normal terms, not in the jargony terms of this essay. Thomas Pangle wants to consider the challenge to political philosophy, which is like a small group of philosophers knows the truth, and they also use myths and religion for the proper uh, rule over the many. He wants to contrast that classical view with the view of biblical revelation. Okay, So biblical revelation is not the same as political philosophy. Because political philosophy is the philosopher knows, and the philosopher somehow is the source of the law, not the God is the source of the law. Okay, The best book on this topic that you can read from the ancient world is dun, 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 Plato's Laws, a real masterpiece beauty of a book that I'm teaching in private tutoring, as well as making a course on at millermanschool.com. And maybe the best book that you can read from our time, if you want this summarized in brief, is by Heinrich Meyer. It's called Leo Strauss and the Theological Political Problem. Okay, so, so much for Pangle. I depart from Pangle in two important ways. First, I'm starting out with the predisposition in favor of the political metaphysics of revelation, which by the way, is not a usual thing for me to do. I am very much, how could you put it? If you've followed this channel for any period of time, you know how important Leo Strauss is to me and Plato and that whole great tradition of platonic political philosophy. But for the purposes of this experiment, for the purposes of thinking this through, I start out with the predisposition in favor of the political metaphysics of revelation in order not to distort it in its self-understanding from the outset with respect to the most relevant questions, such as whether it is to be thought of merely as a civil religion. My effort is, as it were, an attempt to revive political theology as a legitimate and worthy dialectical partner antagonist, not of classical political philosophy, to be sure, but of the modern liberal democratic project. In other words, I'm saying against liberalism, Strauss and his school raise classical political philosophy. Thank God they do. It's a beautiful thing. But in this essay against liberalism, I want to raise political theology. Second, unlike Pangle, I want to argue that from the point of view of the political metaphysics of Revelation, the cultural amusement park of modernity ought to be opposed not merely theoretically, but socio-politically, and that to do so would be nowhere as deleterious as that amusement park has been to the dignity, integrity, and nobility of the political metaphysics of Revelation. Understood from within and elaborated faithfully, the Jewish teaching concerning the origins of the whole, the origins of the Jewish people, and the origins of the law constitutes a political theology or political metaphysics of revelation. It is not consistent with, nor should it endeavor to be consistent with, political or elite metaphysics that reject that teaching, whether through rejecting the mysterious creation of the whole by a mysterious God, the divine election of the children of Israel, or the proposition that if the Jewish nation did not originate the Torah, but is manifestly constituted by the Torah, it is necessarily preceded by the Torah, which was created prior to the world and for the sake of which the world was created. In two words, a liberal Judaism is so much wooden iron. By the way, in the last video on Jewish territorial and democratic, if you happen to watch it, I showed you how Israel's Supreme Court justices, they said about a Jewish and democratic state that it's pretty much wooden iron. You know, that they're going to sacrifice the central principle of Judaism, belief in, um, belief in God. So here too, it's the same sort of argument, okay? Same sort of argument. In other words, uh, if you take the Jewish teaching on its own terms, at least this is what I'm experimenting with and exploring in this paper, then it's not going to be compatible with social and political liberalism. Maybe that's self-evident. Maybe it should be. Maybe it isn't. I don't know, but that's the claim. Strauss, to whom any Jewish political theologian today owes the greatest thanks, wrote of Lessing, that man to whom I owe, so to say, everything I've been able to discern in the labyrinth of the grave question of the refutation of Revelation, that his attitude was characterized by an innate disgust against compromises in serious, i.e. theoretical matters, that he admitted only this alternative, orthodoxy or Spinoza, i.e. philosophy, for there is no philosophy other than that of Spinoza. Must not this attitude of innate disgust against compromises transfer to some extent beyond the domain of the theoretical into the domain, hardly of less serious consequence, of the practical? And is not the unwavering defense of theoretical seriousness 
motivated by disgust at the prospect of compromise, itself a practical and political matter. Must not a consistent politics of origins, if it does not wish to dishonor and debase itself, allow the notes sounded at the nexus of ultimate origins, proximate origins, and politics to ring out loudly and clearly? Is not compromise on principle too high a price to pay theoretically, at least for peace, i.e. for the lack of conflict, i.e. for the neutralization of the war of metaphysics, the highest, most intense, most interesting political phenomenon? If you did watch the last video, you may see the connection. I mentioned Strauss in that paper as well. The politics of origins of the political metaphysics of Revelation amounts, I repeat, to political theology. Political theology provides the theoretical foundation for a battle in which only faith meets faith, in which the right faith counters the thousand varieties of heretical faith. Though let no one make the error of collapsing the analysis of faiths, of codes of law, without making the necessary in-depth analysis of their content. On the plane of political theology, Meyer asserts, there can be no neutral parties, but always only political theologians, even if they be theologians of the anti-theological. And this because the problem of the war of metaphysics is rationally undecidable and hence decided by faith. For the political theologian, the truth of revelation calls for and brings about the distinction between friend and enemy. A political metaphysics of revelation must be antagonistic. The extent and target of the antagonisms will vary, but a blanket commitment to avoiding conflict or exclusion is anathema to a betrayal of such a position. Okay, in other words, political theology is not like conflict avoidant and it's not all about inclusivity and equity. That's not what it is. It's going to have friends and enemies. It's going to have clear distinctions. There's going to be an in and out and there's going to be sort of that division. For a political theologian, any theoretical presupposition or political principles that amount to such a betrayal ought to be repudiated or the fact of betrayal of principle ought honestly to be faced. Okay, so we say with Lessing, no compromise on matters of utter importance and seriousness. In the presence of compromise, the conclusion that what has been compromised is not such a matter. So it's like, if you compromised, then you didn't comp compromise a principle. And when it comes to the principles, you don't compromise. In light of a serious political metaphysics of revelation, the alternative offered by classical political philosophy, even if it is admitted as otherwise the loveliest of alternatives, must be rejected as unacceptable. Consider how that alternative mars, while pretending in its own way to sanctify, the fundamental things of political theology. And here I'm going to be quoting, so here's the quote. Because the quest for the beginning for the first things becomes now philosophic or scientific analysis of the cosmos, the place of the divine law, in the traditional sense of the term, where it is a code traced to a personal god, is replaced by a natural order, which may even be called, as it was later to be called, a natural law, or at any rate, to use a wider term, a natural morality. So the divine law in the real and strict sense of the term is only the starting point, the absolutely essential starting point for Greek philosophy, but it is abandoned in the process. Must the political theologian know more than that his law, his Torah, is abandoned in the movement from the political metaphysics of revelation to the elite metaphysics of philosophic or scientific cosmology? In other words, what have we said? In moving from the divinely revealed code of law to political philosophy, along the way, you abandon the very principle of revelation. Which, by the way, is another way, another, another topic that for sure is at the heart of the laws of Plato. You start with the revealed code of law but gradually you move away from the notion of revelation. You reconstruct it, you abandon it, but you move towards something else. Well, if you know that and you are a true believer, then you have to be suspicious at what political philosophy is going to do to your precious law. This is not to deny that on classical grounds, this movement has its justifications. It's to deny that those justifications amount to what is ultimately needed, a refutation of the possibility of revelation. Let us return to the beginning. I started off by arguing that some historically relevant accounts of origins with political consequences can be summarized according to whether they admit of primordial intellect or not on one hand and whether they speak of a first beginning or not on the other. Okay, that was our first table. I did not mean to provide an exhaustive overview of every possible account of ultimate origins. Someone like Heidegger, for instance, for whom the question of both ultimate and proximate origins is indeed a crucial one, did not figure in my presentation. Moreover, Although I indicated three different accounts of creation, creation from nothing, creation out of God, and creation out of eternal matter, 
I did not pursue the social political consequences of those accounts, some of which are touched upon by Pangle. For instance, I ignored the relationship between the notion of divine punishment, useful for a city's criminal code, the notion of resurrection, useful for the notion of divine punishment after death, and the notion of the creation of the whole out of nothing, useful for the notion of the resurrection of the body. Okay, so in other words, as you see, I wrote about this on another occasion. There are certain basic theological ideas like resurrection, creation of the whole out of nothing, which serve an important function in a city's criminal code, believe it or not. Instead, after arguing that accounts of proximate origins depend implicitly or explicitly on accounts of ultimate origins, I introduced the fourfold distinction between political metaphysics, elite metaphysics, civil religion, and harmful error, as you saw, onto which accounts of origins could be projected. Then, having suggested that this schema is helpful for classifying classical political philosophy generally as an elite metaphysics with a civil religion, again, the philosopher who knows and the many who believe, and modern political science as a political metaphysics of materialism, where you think materialism is true and useful, which views religion as a more or less harmful error, like a scientistic anti-religious worldview, I turn to focus on one account of proximate and ultimate origins, the Jewish account. The Jewish account, I argued, is a political metaphysics of revelation or a political theology, central to which are the accounts of the origins of the whole, the origins of the Jewish people, and the origins of the law. Issuing as it does in a code of divine positive law, this account is theological political, taking the term political in a broad sense, not in a strict and classical sense. In other words, not dealing just with the polis, but dealing with the political community broadly. With the Jewish account as my theme, I argued that attempts to engage political theology from the perspective of political philosophy amount from the Jewish standpoint to a sacrifice of the integrity of political theology, a sacrifice that I argued ought to be resisted by the political theologian, i.e. by the one who accepts the Torah's teachings concerning origins. This resistance is justified, I said, at least by the failure of its dialectical partner or antagonist to refute the serious question concerning the possibility of revelation. In effect, I've argued using in part the assertions of numerous would-be restorers of classical political philosophy that the multiplicity of accounts of ultimate origins, which was rendered politically innocuous by the, meta by the modern project of metaphysical neutralization, constitutes a war of metaphysics. For in Pangle's apt phrase, the alternatives are dialectical partners slash antagonists, i.e. not all of them are dialectical partners with each other. Okay, there's an antagonism. As Meyer averred, at least the political theologies among them allow of no neutrality, only of friends and enemies, and hence of antagonists. Where there's one dialectical partner and one antagonist at the table, not companionship but war results. Therefore, not the presence of dialectical partners in the ranks of accounts of origins, but even a single antagonist may render the differences of opinion a war of opinions or a war of metaphysics. It may take two to tango, it takes one sad to say to fight. Thus, to repeat the multiplicity of opinions concerning the ultimate origins, a problem which is not apparently decidable in the final instance, owing at least to the lack of a refutation of revelation constitutes a war of metaphysics. You can't get political theology off the table until you refute the basic premise of theology, revelation. Revelation hasn't been refuted, political theology is on the table. Political theology is on the table, you have an antagonism. You must have an antagonism because these two things are irreconcilable and any reconciliation comes only at the level of first principles. But by assumption here, the groups are not willing to sacrifice their first principles. We're not going the way of the cultural amusement park. We're not going the way of neutralizations. We are here standing firm with our first principles and therefore warring metaphysics and therefore as well political antagonism. I indicated further that Pangle would like to open up this war on the level of thought, but not on the sociopolitical level. To paraphrase Strauss, the virtue of thought is excess, that of action, moderation. Yet, owing to the risk that a moderation of political theology amounts to its betrayal, and assuming that the betrayal of Judaism in particular is an ignoble and not a necessary act, I argued for the need to consider whether it's not perhaps an inescapable consequence, at least of a disgust for compromise concerning serious matters, that the war of metaphysics, and in particular the war on Judaism by liberalism, ought not to be acknowledged by the former, by Judaism, as a war worth fighting both theoretically and practically. Throughout, it has been first explicit, then implicit, and now worth again stating explicitly that the war of metaphysics, in particular the war of liberal and Jewish metaphysics, is a war because undecidable and not always merely dialogical, that is as clearly as anything can be enmeshed in the overall theme of politics of origins. 
I tried to establish through the authority of Strauss, Valkley, and Pangle that the modern liberal project, indisputably a political project, whatever else it might be, depends essentially either on an explicit account of ultimate origins or an implicit one constituted by negation. They all say modernity is a political teaching that has a specific doctrine about man's beginning. And that specific doctrine is in clear contrast to the pre-modern teaching about man's beginning. So in that sense, it's very clearly a politics of origins, the modern project, according to all these thinkers. Okay, so that is for the modern project, no species, forms, or wholes of any sort are given parts of a natural order. What is more, the essence of the modern turn to self is the emancipation from all metaphysics. The only wholes to which we belong are those that we construct, as Valkley wrote. Moreover, Jewish political theology requires an account of ultimate origins, creation by God, and a providential account of proximate origins, children of Israel. In other words, the Jewish people, there's a providential history. And it results in a legal teaching for a nation. It rests perfectly at the nexus between politics and origins, taking politics in the broad sense, which allows the themes of law and nationhood to be distinguishing markers of what it means for something to be political. In other words, here I am justifying to the professor that, look, Jewish political theology clearly falls within the realm of politics of origins because you have the origins, God created universe, okay, all of that, culminating in the constitution of nationhood under a divinely revealed law. Like you don't have a clear case of it in some sense. Many of the arguments I've made thus far are open to criticism. Ought one to be ashamed to compromise one's principles for the sake of theoretical agreement? And so much the more for practical peace and quiet as far as that goes? Like maybe not, you know, maybe you should be able to compromise on your first principles for the sake of peace and uh, coexistence. Or is the tendency to view compromise as desirable in itself not a sign of the victory to be protested of a specific set of principles once particular now masquerading as universal? In other words, doesn't this, uh, isn't the pretended universalism of the desire for peace actually a war on all particularism? If it profit a man little to lose his soul and gain the world, does it profit a man much to lose his Judaism and gain a liberalism that afforded him so much protection where it first arose that there the Jewish-German problem was never solved but was annihilated by the annihilation of the German Jews? In other words, Jews gave up their Judaism for a liberalism that couldn't even protect them in the final instance. Actually, it was only able to deal with the Jewish problem by the annihilation of the Jews, as Strauss writes. Then again, is it not precisely the call for a war of metaphysics that resulted in the annihilation of the Jewish problem and not only in the Weimar Republic? So like, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Because to try to deal with the issue by going to liberalism wasn't successful. But at the same time, the warring metaphysics also puts Judaism and the Jewish people and the Jewish state, but for, for sure, everything Jewish under the gun. Because, you know, there's anti-Jewish political theologies that could destroy, you see? So it's like, this is the question that I'm raising here. You know, I'm talking about warring metaphysics in order to protect against the liberal threat, but there's also a political theological threat that's as serious and a metaphysical threat that's as serious and an anti-Jewish threat that's as serious. Does not the call for a manly and a godly Jewish political theology run the risk of inflaming competing political theologies and political metaphysics of all stripes against the Jew who sought or at any rate was given shelter in the liberalism against which I am advocating in this particular piece. So that's like admittedly, I would say, a puzzle. I do not, alas, have the answers to these difficult questions. So long as there's a dispute concerning origins and so long as some of those disputed accounts of origins issue in a political teaching and consistent with the political teachings that are a function of competing accounts, if fidelity to principle means anything, the theoretical war of metaphysics will inescapably overflow the domain of the theoretical into the practical as it has done before terrifyingly. So I don't see that this is the, a problem with the solution necessarily. And although it may be granted that an assertion does not become true because it is shown to be terrifying, as Strauss once wrote, it must also be said that a truth does not become false for failing to comfort. I admit that I hardly know of a better statement of the impasse than Strauss's. From every point of view, it looks as if the Jewish people were the chosen people, at least in the sense that the Jewish problem is the most manifest symbol of the human problem insofar as it is a social or political problem. You remember I opened up the essay with that quote, and hopefully by the end of the essay, you can now understand a little bit more why 
I did so. So there you go. That was a paper on warring metaphysics, on the politics of origins, on Jewish political theology. I hope that you learned something from it, that you enjoyed my reading of it. Please feel free to like, share, comment, subscribe. Guys, if you want to support the work that I do here, if you're learning from these videos, philosophyintro.com will give you a free introduction to philosophy by email. Millermanschool.com offers courses on Strauss, Heidegger, Schmidt, and other people that I teach, Dugan. Uh, definitely take a look at those. And uh, I'll see you in the next video.